In this final session, we explore the impact of climate change, which is already playing out throughout the world. Uh, Vanessa Nakate is a 24-year-old Ugandan climate activist and the founder of the Africa-based Rise Up movement. She began striking for the climate in her hometown of Kampala in January 2019, after witnessing droughts and flooding devastating communities in Uganda, and focuses particularly on how the climate crisis is exacerbating poverty, conflict and gender inequality. We're delighted to welcome Vanessa Nakate. Vanessa, over to you. Thank you very much. Greetings to you all. My name is Vanessa Nakate and I'm a climate activist and I'm happy to be speaking with all of you today. I started doing activism in the first week of January 2019 after seeing and researching about how climate change was affecting the people in my country, Uganda. It turns out it is one of the biggest threats that is affecting their lives. I went on to read about how the climate crisis is already ravaging different parts of the African continent, which is tragic and ironic when you think about how Africa is the lowest emitter of CO2 emissions of all continents except for Antarctica. Each year, the entire continent of Africa contributes less than a third of the CO2 emitted by the United States. Historically, Africa, the entire continent, is responsible for only 3% of global emissions. And yet Africans are already suffering some of the most brutal impacts fueled by the climate crisis. Rapidly intensifying hurricanes, devastating floods, and withering droughts. This is not just weather, this is people. Many Africans have lost their lives, while countless have lost their homes, farms and businesses. As we continue to hit the planet, things in Africa continue to get worse. Cyclone Idai was one of the worst cyclones to affect the African continent, ripping apart and flooding large parts of Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Malawi. The strong winds and heavy rainfall left more than 1,300 people dead and many more were recorded as missing. It left something else, an economic crisis. This year, the water levels of Lake Victoria have risen as a result of heavy rainfall in East Africa. Homes have been flooded, farms have been washed away, people have been displaced, submerged toilets, and this has led to a water and food crisis. East Africa was invaded by swarms of locusts brought on by heavy rainfall and abnormally warm temperatures. The locusts ate everything in their path. Crops were divided, threatening the availability of food for the people in the region. In September, massive flooding in Sudan nearly killed, no, it actually killed nearly a hundred people and made thousands homeless. The Nile regularly busts its banks and farmers rely on the flood waters to create fertile land. But people who live along the Nile say they had never seen anything like that extent of this year's flooding. Southern parts of Africa have experienced terrible droughts that are leading to food insecurity and water scarcity. The water levels of Zambezi River, Lake Chad, Victoria Falls are lower than they have been for decades. Lake Chad especially has shrunk to a tenth of its original size in just 50 years. Over five years of drought in countries like Somalia have left almost half of the population with little to eat or drink. And half of Nigeria has no access to water. According to Oxfam, 12 million people in Ethiopia, 
Kenya and Somalia are in dire need of food because of the rising climate-related disasters. The droughts and floods have left nothing behind for the people, nothing except for pain, agony, suffering, starvation, and death. For every 1% increase in drought, there is a 2.4% decrease in agriculture output. Again, those are not just statistics. Less rain means farms will collapse. Less rains people means people will lose their livelihoods. Less rain means children will go hungry. And yet while Africa endures an ever increasing list of climate related disasters, you wouldn't know it from watching the news. You see, while the African continent is on the front lines of the climate crisis, it is not on the front pages of the world's newspapers. While the media focuses on wildfires in California or flooding in Europe, climate-related catastrophes in Africa receive little coverage. What is the main response from the developed countries for the social and economic crisis fueled by the burning of fossil fuels? greater and greater investment in the exploration and extraction of fossil fuels. I have one thing to say to countries and the banks who continue to fund the digging up and burning of fossil fuels in Africa. We cannot eat coal and we cannot drink oil. I know that we must find new solutions to help tackle the climate crisis. I know that there are clean energy technologies that need investment and research and development. But we also need to massively increase support for the things we know will work and could help right now. Project Drawdown is a well-respected ranking of solutions to tackle climate change. It lists the top 100 solutions that would contribute the most to the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Educating girls and young women as the sixth most powerful solution for climate change. It is high impact, it is cost effective, and it can be done now and everywhere. Just beneath it, ranked as the seventh most powerful solution, is the connected issue of family planning. Why is educating girls and young women and family, family planning so important? Girls and young women are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. What is more, educating girls has an impact beyond the individual cascading into her family and her community. Research shows that women with higher levels of good quality education marry later and have fewer and healthier children. They live longer and enjoy greater economic prosperity. So why are so few people talking about this solution? Why are so few stories written about this solution? Why is so little money flowing to this solution? We need to be excited about educating and empowering girls as we are about the next shiny technological solution. We need to fund education for girls and family planning and we need to do it on a massive scale and we need to start now. And there is a certain role for those working in the tech sector to support education for girls and family planning. I am speaking directly to you now, the community that is inspired by Wired. We need your help. Of course, it is not just girls that need education, but it is girls and young women who are largely being left behind. Many rural communities have women do most of the family chores of putting food on the table and fetching water for their families. 
But with all these disasters, they must work double to recover what has been lost. Many students have to drop out of school to help their parents recover all that has been lost to climate change. When women can't access loans, political offices, or land ownership, that means half of the population is left out of the workforce and sustainability decisions. And surely, when we are facing such a great challenge, why would we leave half of the world's guardians, problem-solving, ability, and indigenity on the sidelines? This is like trying to win the game with only half of the team on the field. When there are increasing droughts, girls and women must walk longer and longer distances to collect water. This puts them at a risk of getting back X or far worse, gender-based violence as they walk long distances to fetch water. In some parts of Africa, when a family is hit by a climate disaster and they lose everything, they are forced to give up some of their children for marriage. And who else but the girl child since they can receive bride price in return? Our girls are being given up for marriage because their families are losing everything to climate change. At extreme weather events caused by rising temperatures like droughts, floods and storms kill more women than men and tend to kill younger women. This is in part because girls and young women are more likely than boys and men to live in poverty, which limits their access to medicine, housing aid, and other life-saving resources. Now for the good news, Project Drawdown calculated that by taking steps towards educating girls and young women and investing in family planning in developing nations, we could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 50 gigatons by 2050. Almost universally, research since the 1980s shows that women with higher levels of good quality education marry later and have fewer and healthier children. That is roughly 10 years worth of, Af of China's annual emissions. And it's all because the world's population won't rise quite rapidly. Adding climate education to the curriculum would also help citizens tackle climate-related issues such as food and water scarcity or flood protection. There is yet another reason to educate girls and young women. It turns out that many of the young climate activists around the world are girls. As Greta Thunberg said recently, while leaders keep making the same old speeches and the same empty promises, girls and young women are taking action. We are the ones treating the climate and ecological crisis as a crisis. We cannot continue to have girls sacrifice time they could be using to study instead of walking long distances to find water. We cannot continue to have girls and young women exposed to gender-based violence. We cannot continue to have any more child brides. Our leaders must stop talking and start acting. And yes, we need research and development for new energy technologies. But we also need to get behind the solutions that we know already work. And to really empower girls and young women all around the world, we need everyone to do their part. And that includes you, and it starts now. Thank you very much.
Vanessa, thank you so much for an inspiring uh, talk there. Uh, I've just got a couple of questions. We've got questions coming in from the audience as well. But first of all, clearly we are in a crisis. Clearly time is running out. How do you feel we can accelerate the pace of change? Well, I think that we as citizens, we as young people, we need to keep speaking up. As you have seen the pandemic, it has exposed a lot of our vulnerabilities in the societies with people struggling to find food to eat, with people struggling to get water, with people struggling to get health facilities in this pandemic. I believe this should be our motivation to move towards a future that is healthier, a future that is livable, a future that is sustainable for all of us. And we can only do that by building back better. Let us continue striking. Let us continue writing letters. Let us continue signing petitions to ensure that our leaders take the decisions that will save our planet, that will save our lives, that will save our ecosystems. Clearly, we need our leaders to step up. Are there any countries in the world, any leaders that you see who are really driving meaningful change? I haven't seen the meaningful change that we really want to see because all we are seeing are promises of taking action by 2050, by 2038. I think it's important for all leaders to understand that we do not have time left. We lost time the moment people started dying as a result of climate change. We lost time the moment children started to sleep hungry because their families had lost everything to climate change. So this is a call for all leaders to start treating this crisis as a crisis. That is the only way that we will start seeing the action from them. And what words do you have for those people watching us today? How can they, as individuals, make real change in the world? As individuals, you have the opportunity to be part of this change, to be part of this transformation. I, I know that the world faces quite a number of challenges in different parts, you know, in different countries, people face challenges from poverty, from access to health facilities, from inequalities to climate change. Find that thing that you feel you can do to drive change. We cannot live in this world because we only have one life. So use this one life of yours to change someone's life. I believe that we all have the ability to drive change. And it doesn't matter how big your resources are. It doesn't matter how small they are. What matters are those small actions. Because if millions of people carry out small actions in their communities, when we put them together, then we will be able to transform the world. We will be able to have a world that is just, a world that is fair, a world that is livable and clean for all of us. Just be part of the transformation. Vanessa Nakate, thank you so much for your inspiring presentation today and for joining us at Wildlife uh, from Kampala. Thank you so much. Thank you too. I was happy to.